Welcome. Aloha. Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii. Time for responsible change. And today we're going to talk about affirmative action, one of the cases that the Supreme Court will be dealing with shortly. Uh, and I use the term dealing with in its loosest possible sense. Uh, we have the good fortune to have with us today, Tina Patterson, mediator, arbitrator of national and international experience and business experience and consultant. Uh, Doug Chen, former Lieutenant Governor and Attorney General of the State of Hawaii and partner director at the Starno Tool Law Firm here. And David Larson, who has just become the immediate past chair of the American Bar Association section of dispute resolution and a distinguished professor, respected professor at the Mitchell Hamlin School of Law in St. Paul in the Twin Cities. Welcome all of you. Affirmative action. Any ground for optimism left or where are we headed here? Tina? There's always ground for optimism. And I, I do think I'm especially optimistic knowing that the, um, the face of the Supreme Court justice has changed. Um, with the, the new justice coming on board, it gives me hope. But I think there's also hope in terms of the conversation regarding affirmative action isn't just, oh, I'm, I'm giving this to you because you didn't deserve it. It's more about making sure that the, the people in our workforce that everybody's given an opportunity to be at the table. And I know that there are some that don't feel that way, but I think I'm still optimistic. That's a great way to put it. Doug? Well, I, I'm actually thrilled that we're starting off with, with optimism. Yeah, because I, I, think, I think all of us are, could use that. We could all, uh, we can all appreciate that these days. Um, I, I think I would have just answered the question and said, I, I am concerned. And I think it, it's a concern for people in Hawaii as well as all around the country. Uh, but in our state, it, it means something. And that's because uh, we have such a high um, portion of our population that is represented by different minorities. Um, that includes Native Hawaiians. Um, it includes um, you know, other, other minorities. And, and so to put affirmative action at issue uh, in front of a, a very conservative court that we have now, um, I, I think is concerning. And uh, it's something that we're all going to have to watch for. And I think educational institutions in particular are, are going to be um, watching for it because they could be seeing um, perhaps even similar to the, the Dobbs decision. They, they could be seeing like decades of, of a certain practice being reversed very quickly. Um, so, uh, so I think that's something that we all have to be somewhat concerned about as we're watching the arguments unfold. David? I guess I'm optimistic, um, like Tina, that we finally put a black woman in the Supreme Court, so we've evolved enough in that respect. But we're looking at a 6-3 um, court now. And we're looking at a court that is so eager to get into hot button issues that they just can't, they can't restrain themselves. And I think they're going to go after every hot button issue they can. And I'm, I'm concerned about uh, how ideological all of, all of those opinions are going to be. You know, and that's a great insight, David, because in their eagerness, we have seen them take cases, do shadow docket cases, and issue rulings on cases with far less than a full record, sometimes without even briefings and arguments. Where is that coming from? What's behind that eagerness, that rush to judgment? I just think it's frustration that we have not been able to get our way for a while. We feel like the momentum and tide is, have been running against us, and now it's our turn. And you know, we'll be darned if we're going to let this opportunity pass. Um, we're going to get as much done as quickly as we can, not unlike um, endorsing a new Supreme Court justice in a week. <laughs> it's like, we don't have much time, but let's get things done. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's 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 what it is, I think. The idea that this is this is a golden opportunity for us. We have a super majority. Um, nobody can stop us. Um, so we're going to run with it. Yeah. So where specifically do you see reason for optimism other maybe than the cholesterol counts of certain justices? 
Dana? Oh, goodness. Oh. All right. So first, let me um, say, yes, I am optimistic, but I'm also very, I, there was a, a, a strong dose of realism. Um, and I think, as David mentioned, it's this, this zeal to let's react and not think about what the implications are. And we saw that with the over, overturn of Roe versus Wade. Um, I think we'll see the same thing here where there's just, um, we're not thinking about how it impacts not just academia, but how it impacts how we hire, how we fire, and the what the message that goes out. So um, I, I think that it is going to be a challenge. I think without really doing that, um, the due diligence and the analysis and looking at what are, what are the circumstances underlying these cases that are coming forward, and do those circumstances still apply today? I, I, that is what causes me to think that um, this could literally end up falling flat in, in terms of the final analysis. If the decision is to make changes, that you'll see individual states saying, "Yeah, but what about this? And did you think about that? And what about in this instance?" Um, again, I'm, I'm thinking again about how what's happened with Roe versus Wade being overturned. Individual states are coming up and saying, "You know, but." We've got this law going back to 1928 or 1930. How does that apply here? And the state, local justice saying it doesn't, but under these special circumstances, or we find the outlier where you've got a case where it wasn't even considered. So those are those are some of my concerns um, regarding how this moves forward in terms of application and the the real due diligence. I think it's helpful that we've got some justices that have had um, practical experience in other sectors so that they can apply that as they do their analysis and as they look at the application of the law. But some others, um, Clarence Thomas in particular, I'm not so sure that he um, has the requisite experience or knowledge to, to really weigh in on this matter. Good perspective. David, Doug? I'll let Doug go first. Go ahead. Sure. Um, I, I mean, I think something that there is reason to be optimistic about is to see how, how much the public is watching what the court does. Um, so similar to what Tina was already mentioning, um, it, it does seem that after the Dobbs decision, uh, the public reacted. And, um, and so uh, even though I think my own personal preference would have been that the court would have ruled a certain way. Um, when they did rule opposite of how I was thinking about it, um, the, the public was watching and they reacted. And we saw that in, in uh, the, uh, the constitutional uh, amendment that, that occurred, vote that occurred in Kansas, uh, where they then uh, you know, upheld uh, the right to an abortion. Um, and, and we see how the, it's possibly affecting the midterms, although we have to see how the next, the next month um, plays out. Um, I, I do think the other thing that, that's fascinating to me as I was thinking about the, the question is, is that uh, you're right. I mean, I think for all of us who are lawyers, we, we just think of the Supreme Court as like, well, this is where the buck stops. Like once you have a Supreme Court decision, then everything else that could possibly flow under this decision um, gets impacted by that. And, and so I, I think that's where, you know, as Tina was talking about the if, 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 you, if the justices aren't really performing their due diligence, it's kind of like they, they make they make a. A, a big decision that you know, lurches everything in the opposite direction um, without really thinking, how does that play out in every other possible situation? Um, so I certainly don't mean to take us off topic from affirmative action, because that's really important. Um, but I think about how the, the Masterpiece Cake Shop case um, is essentially getting a do-over uh, in this next session um, where a similar circumstance is gonna be raised in front of the court. And, and again, there, there's gonna be the situation where, you know, if a business is allowed to say, Look, I'm not going to be doing work for you because of my religious beliefs. Um, there's, if the court allows that to happen and doesn't, is it nuanced enough in how they describe what they're allowing? Um, then it allows people in the U.S. to be able to uh, do a lot of things based off of religious beliefs, including um, discriminating against people because of their race or you know, or because of their ethnicity, um, because of their religious freedoms. Um, so again, I don't mean to take us off topic, but I, but I, I was meant that as an example of how um, how these decisions they're very momentous, and and I think um, you know, I think there will be some sort of um, check and balance uh, even to the Supreme Court 
uh, based off of the decisions that they make this year. Okay, okay two things. One, I should have let them go. For, I should not have let them go first because that's what I was going to say. So that's always a cost of replying. But but thank you for being so insightful. Um, uh, I I'll just I had the same idea because Gallup poll was recently. Um, surveyed and they came out and said 25% of the public no longer has faith in the Supreme Court. That's got to get their attention. And Justice Roberts, if, or whatever you think of him, does worry about the reputation and integrity of the court. So that's got to be getting their attention, the fact that 75% of the people are losing their faith in the United States Supreme Court. So I hate to be optimistic because things are so bad, but maybe the fact that things are so bad will make it, make it get better. So in that sense, um, I think it's maybe maybe a little encouraging. Um, I hope so. I hope that can turn around like that. Um, in the in the website design case, I think one of the one of the unsettling things about that, it's not just a religious expression concern. It's a freedom of expression concern under the First Amendment. And so, if that's how it's going to be pitched now, um, you could have a white supremacist, um, you know, saying that it's my my expression to discriminate against based on race um you know i think it's really ex it has explosive potential um if they rule in favor of this website designer on the freedom of expression claim that who knows where that's going to go no and that's a great insight because exactly as you're indicating <laughs> this spans the entire gamut of discrimination cases and issues whether it be educational, voting rights, employment, or, or any other area, that the Supreme Court's already in the employment area eroded and limited discrimination, discrimination cases down to a fairly high standard of proof of intent, and knowing intent to discriminate. Clearly, Justice Alito, if he's able to dominate, wants to take this court in that direction. The very argument in the pending Alabama case between Justice Katanji Brown Jackson, who cited accurately the true history of the 14th and 15th Amendments to the Constitution, which, as far as we know, are still part of the Constitution, although there may be justices on the Supreme Court that don't regard that as a legitimate basis for a legal decision. Uh, well, we know where Clarence Thomas would go. Um, I went to the EOC Appellate Division in Washington shortly after Clarence Thomas was chair. He wasn't chair when I went there. But when he was chair, he set out the uh, the command that we're not going to litigate disparate impact cases. Um, I don't believe in the theory. I just, you're going to have to prove intent. And um, this very viable long settled theory suddenly dropped out of the arsenal of anti-discrimination work. So I just think that as Chuck's mentioning, that he will be on board with the idea that, you know, I'm going to, I'm only going to intervene in the most extreme situation. Yeah, I think he signaled that pretty clearly, including in the Dobbs decision. Um, so What other deficiencies do you see in the approach that the right-wing Supreme Court justices have been taking in recent decisions that might give them pause before going off headlong in that direction with a feeling of impunity because they have lifetime appointments and no ethics code? Dave, it was right. Um, for the Chief Justice, Chief Justice Roberts, there is concern because th this, is, um, this is another matter in which he, he has some sway. He has opportunity to, to literally have a thoughtful, intentional discussion or some type of analysis. Um, and I'm thinking back as far as the impeachment proceedings and the, with the previous administration, this lack of um, direction or guidance and his ability to really um, have the, a, a focused conversation or a purposeful conversation 
is seen by the public. And, and I think it's part of that, that 25% have lost confidence because they're seeing things leaked out that in the past wouldn't have been leaked out or things that they thought would be dis addressed or discussed at a later time suddenly being advanced and with no rhyme or reason. So I think there, there's some opportunity for him and there's some concern because at this point, I'm not sure that history is going to look kindly. Um, and I like Supreme, I'm sorry, uh, Chief Justice Roberts, but some of this, this, his analysis, his knowing that he's been considered a strong jurist, it just kind of makes me wonder what's going on. And, and I think that more than anything else would give him pause to think about what happens next, especially on this, this, um, on this matter. Doug, I wanted to say, I know you thought it was tangential, but it runs parallel. The, mm. the, the, it, it definitely runs parallel because there, there's so many similarities. So that um, I, I think with the chief justice, there's a, a bigger concern for some of the other justices. You know, they're, they're, they're feeling like, you know, this is an opportunity for me to make my mark, even if it does, the decision doesn't go in my direction. I can always write a minority opinion or a dissenting opinion. Yeah, and we were talking, it's worse than we think. It wasn't that 25% have lost faith. It's that 7, 20, only 25% have faith, which means oh, 75% even worse. I'm sorry. have lost faith, which is much more unnerving. Um, so yeah, that's, but but yes, I, and that's what I'm saying. That if it's gotten that bad, that's got to get their attention. That, uh, you know, if, if nobody believes in us, Nobody believes in the rule of law. Um, then we go into chaos. Then we go into anarchy. Then we go into authoritarianism. Um, that opens the door for you know the, the the worst kind of government. Yeah, and and I think one of the things that we saw was just how, like, I mean, prior to the Dobbs decision, uh, the the midterms uh, did not look like a out, good outcome for um, the. The Democratic Party. I mean, I think everything, every, all the entire talk was about inflation. Um, the yeah. focus of the nation was on that, um, and it was impacting. I think everybody's expectation uh, was that um, the election would completely swing towards the, the House and Senate being controlled again by the Republican Party. Um, but I think what was clear was that when the Supreme Court made the decisions, that the, the broad decisions that they made. Um, that it's now at least become a, an issue um, that has made the, the midterm elections um, up for grabs in, in certain races uh, where they would never have been up for grabs. And so I, I think that's um, that also must be something that uh, you would hope that the, the, um, that the right wing side of the, the justices uh, would be taking into account. Um, I was actually interested in, in the, the the perspective that it's probably that it's been a pent up demand from from all these these years of of being the minority to all of a sudden being able to you know, to have their um, have their way in terms of decisions that are made. Uh, but I, I just I, I think that the, the the rapid the rapidity of how quickly the, the all these these changes are being made. Um, I, I think the I think it fails to recognize that society and the country. Has moved on, <laughs> you know. Like that, in other words, the, the country has evolved and and moved further uh, than than where, um, and, and so that there's a reaction to what the people are seeing. Yeah, along those lines um, of evolving, um, when the Constitution was written, the majority of this Supreme Court didn't have the right to vote. <laughs> so that's that, I mean, that's that's a very real evolution we've had. Um, I wish we had like two hours today because these topics are really good. But um, you know, and I'm, I'm partially responsible for this, but I don't want to run out of time and not talk about affirmative action. And uh, because that's one of the big cases, and, and Doug was also mentioning that he wants to get back to it too. Um, yep. Now, I always start that discussion with, I, I just regret that that is the label that's put on this kind of conduct, affirmative action, because I don't think it's, I, I think it's a misnomer. I think it's really remedial action. Because the whole, you can't have an affirmative action plan without a factual predicate. You need some justification for doing it, and that justification is, has almost always been what we call past sins. You know, you know, past instances of of, of discrimination, a manifest imbalance in traditionally segregated job categories. But you had to point to some reason. 
or have an affirmative action, just couldn't do it because you wanted to. And, um, you know, I think a, a kind of a difference is when you look at the Americans with Disabilities Act and you talk about making reasonable accommodations and making financial investments and could be substantial, if you're going to use the term affirmative action, that's a little bit more of affirmative action than in the in the race discrimination area, which I really think the proper term is remedial action. Um, so, so yeah, it's like to start the conversation, I just think it's been framed incorrectly from the beginning, which then points people to exaggerate the results. I've been on four, I've been on five faculties, tenured at four schools and lots of admissions committees. And um, yeah, I think that people are way over exaggerating the influence of any kind of affirmative action considerations on admissions. You look at all kinds of things in people's lives and you look at maybe they had alcoholic parent, maybe they had a drug dealer as a parent, maybe they had you know, terrible poverty. I mean, there's all kinds of things you consider. And the notion that somehow um, race is going to be the controlling factor in admissions is just not accurate. Well, and that's a great insight because as Justice Katanji Brown Jackson has taken the lead in pointing out, emphasizing, and making clear, despite what Justice Alito may contend, the 14th and 15th Amendment were put in place to try to counter systemic discrimination, not individual intentional discrimination only, that as well, but the systemic discrimination. And the primary marker of this systemic discrimination is disparate impact. It sweeps in intentional, negligent, and any other forms of discrimination that achieve that result. That was the purpose of those amendments and that constitutional direction, which was also the purpose of the 1964 and 65 Civil Rights Act and accompanying legislation. So immediately after Dobbs, and applicable to, to affirmative action, hopefully we'll see this again, there was extremely strong adverse reaction and assertion of rights, not only at the grassroots level by protests, not only women, but wide groups of diverse people, but also at the academic and intellectual level the commentators, the professors, those most knowledgeable about constitutional law and its history and intent uh, came out almost universally in favor of the attacks and criticisms of that Dobbs decision rather than in support of that decision and pointed out uh, the intellectually deficient and dishonest things that that decision had engaged in including some who had been amicus curiae on briefs on that same court. Hey, is that a concern that you believe uh, the Trumpists and Alito and Thomas will really pay any attention to? Well, I think we know how the, the, the Trumpists and the conservative, the, the, the far conservative, portion of the Supreme Court is going to be looking at things. I think when it comes to affirmative action, I think what's what strikes me, at least from some, what I've seen Chief Justice Roberts say before about affirmative action is that he really, to my, in my view, it seems like he um, really doesn't want to be having people make, you know, entities making decisions based on race. Um, and so he, and so that's that's a concern because it it, it seems like when it comes to affirmative action, that Chief Justice Roberts, for his own reasons, uh, will end up having making decisions uh, that that go against affirmative action because he doesn't want universities or um, or um, entities to be making decisions based on race that they should just not be thinking about it at all. Um, and and um, I think that that goes against the idea that at least in, in the back of people's minds, or, or maybe even it just there should be an awareness. Um, that uh, that not every group gets the same opportunities um, that every other group has, and that that's really sort of been a bedrock of, of what the the U.S. has been all about, um, and certainly was for me and my my family when you know when my parents came over as um, you know as immigrants to the United States, and me and my sister were born here. And we've seen that 
in the language that Chief Justice Roberts has used in prior decisions, basically saying, uh, we don't have any more discrimination, particularly in education, uh, so we don't need that anymore. And Justice Alito has seized on that, even in a clearly racially based, not just politically based, gerrymandering in Alabama case that was argued this week, uh, saying, Okay, so if it's race neutral, it's good. And if it comes out of computer, it must be race neutral. Now, my 15 year old nephew knows more about coding and algorithms than obviously Justice Alito does. But leading scholars all over have talked about the input of implicit bias into AI, into computerized systems, into the algorithms and assumptions that make up these things. And you don't come out with one majority black district in a 27% black state with a racially neutral computer algorithm AI system. It just doesn't happen. So you we're seeing a level of intellectual dishonesty that we have not seen since Justice Rehnquist, unfortunately. One of the, one of the what I think is one of the best examples or justifications for affirmative uh, action refers to a foot race. And um, you know, if one party starts ahead, gets a gets a 500 yard lead and you start the race and the conditions are perfectly fine for that entire race, it's not gonna be surprising if that first party doesn't end the race 500 yards ahead. Um, and I think the point of affirmative action is a recognition that some groups are starting with a lead and that um, that gap will never be closed unless we do something to close that gap. And the plan was always that it would be a temporary approach, that if we do this, that gap will close. And this is gonna be engaged in forever, but let's not pretend that we have all kinds of numbers from the Bureau of Labor Statistics that show that when it comes to wages, um, home ownership, uh, all kinds of economic indicators, those gaps haven't been closed. So to take a, to take an idea that we need to do something temporarily to address these historical inequities that have caused these gaps and to try and close them doesn't seem unreasonable at all. So then we have the ultimate challenge. How do you accomplish something that is race equitable eh, rather than race neutral and privilege neutral, which is the real underlying threat. And I, Tina, I see you smiling. You know exactly what I'm talking about, right? I do. Um, and I think that's a very, that's a very um, fluid tightrope because by virtue of being here, I could go either way. I could go the privilege route, um, and that would be based on education, um, lifestyle, but then there is the, the representation, um, being a woman of color and being a woman. So um, that's, I smile because I, I think I don't, when we start to bring the privilege conversation in, it 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 divides that it divides us yet again. And instead, I'd like to talk about if we're going to talk about race, let's talk about how reflective our 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 leadership is in in the communities that we serve. Whether that's an academic institution, if you know that the community in which you serve is a mix of fifty two percent African American, twenty percent Latino, 12% Asian, and you have a 90% um, white staff, why? Why, why is that? H how does that reflect? It, to me, that's the, the larger conversation. When we talk about the workforce, when we bring it, when we're talking about bringing in students or recruiting students, I, it's interesting, I'm with an organization and they constantly tell us we can't find qualified students. And I, I normally have to mention historically black college and universities. Well, did you reach out to them? And I get the, um, well, 
And I know what it is because the, the, but there's a belief that there aren't qualified students there. So let's start with everybody's qualified. And then how do we make the, the, either our leadership or our student population, and I'm going to talk about academia, reflect the community that, that we either serve or that we're around. Um, to me, that's that's part of it. But the, the privilege part, again, it starts to, it divides that again, because I think, and I, I'll, again, use myself as an example. Um, you know, if we're going to talk about privilege and not talk about race, it puts me in a different group. And I, I, I'm happy to recognize that. But I also need us to talk about what that means for someone who doesn't have that privilege and still is part of an either historically um, marginalized community. Doug, in our last minute, parting, parting thoughts? Well, I mean, I think for people in Hawaii who are watching this, I, I think uh, you know, Hawaii is a very small state. Um, it's a majority minority population. And, and so I think um, affirmative action has been something that's been uh, an important part of, of just any any system that, that I think people in Hawaii should be interested in. And so I think what we're looking for in, in the Supreme Court is and what we're going to be seeing happen, um, it's going to have a major effect. And, and I think it's something that everybody should keep watching. Thanks so much, all of you. And a great reminder that the strength inherent in diversity is an objective worthy in and of itself. And that has not been part of the legal analysis or reasoning that the right wing major majority of the Supreme Court has brought to this really important issue. Thank you all. Thanks to the viewers. Come back and join us again. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. Take good care. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.